I'm Swaminathan Sundararaman. I'm an architect at Parallel Machines. Today I'm going to talk about our experience with uh, Spark, sorry, streaming and micro batch for online learning. I'm assuming that everybody knows uh, streaming, micro batch, and batch or offline systems. Batch or offline take all the data at one go, process the data, try to create a model, and then continue from it. On the other end, in streaming, we try to go through one data at a time and try to create models. That's online learning. I'm going to talk about how we build a system and what are the trade-offs and how these things operate. So with today's connected world, especially with the Internet of Things, there are two key challenges. The first thing is that anything and everything are now connected, like the sensors, cameras, phones, videos, video devices and stuff. As a result, we have a stream of data being generated by all the, thing, all the things which we call as things. And it is not possible to send all this data all the way to the cloud or data center to, to understand or understand the behavior or take actions towards it. So we need to close, shorten the round trip time for the data to go from the things on to creating some meaningful inferences or decisions to be made on this real-time data. So that's where the edge or the network comes in, where we can try to place them near the things so they can actually take the streams of data, try to create uh, intelligence from it, and then automatically do some actions on top of it. So, so the edges that we talked about, right, because of Internet of Things, we need to, it, it needs online learning uh, in order to make meaningful real-time decisions. So to, to again uh, focus on the importance of real-time intelligence, real world, as you all know, uh, is unpredictable and can, all, can many times be bursty because of flash crowds and stuff, or special events. And because of data changes, machine learning requires model retraining. And model retraining, as most, most of you already know, is an expensive process. Especially with online machine, uh, offline machine learning, sorry, all the data needs to be go, has to be processed multiple times to create a model, and this model will be used to do inference or to make decisions. But this is impossible, especially with all the data being have to be sent from the things all the way to the data center and back. So real-time decisions or real-time analysis is not possible. So that comes online machine learning or online learning. It is lightweight. And it has very low compute and memory requirements, which is nice because we edges don't have a huge amount of memory and compute resources. And it also, since it continuously learns with incoming data, where it means constantly learns with every data it processes, it can provide better accuracy than offline methods and stuff. So at Parallel Machines, we try to build, we build both online and offline algorithms. And we have built many algorithms on top of Flink. Here are some examples of algorithms that we have built so far. And we used existing Flink primitives to build these algorithms. Uh, some of the examples are core flat map, uh, windowing, iterations, or collect. And aside is that we also are adding Python API support for data stream API. So in the future, for streaming, you should be able to use through Python APIs. And we have put a nice blog. I, I encourage you to take a look at the Python API blog that we've been doing. And we've been working with data artisans, uh, specifically Chesney, to push it to uh, mainstream Flink. So coming to online algorithms, I'm going to give an example here in the context of SVM. But this is applicable for other algorithms also. There are two important challenges when you think about online algorithms. The first challenge is that we need to make sure that we process the data all the time or try to ingest the data all the time and don't stop to synchronize or do additional computation because this will slow down and increase the latency to process all the data. The second challenge, basically, is that we need a way to communicate effectively between the different, uh, we need to parallelize these tasks in order to ingest large volumes on streams so that we can learn quickly and adapt faster. So we need a way to parallelize and also not impact the, the latency of processing each element. So I'm going to take an uh, example of co-flat map for SVM. I'm going to run through the scenario of how we do it in order to address these two important challenges. 
So on the right side, we have a small uh, diagram. Uh, just for simplicity, I've only added two parallel tasks. This can actually be applicable to n parallel tasks seamlessly. So here in this example, you see a data stream where data comes through, data is gets split to two different flat maps in each task lot. It's a data uh, parallel approach of learning and each processes have their own version of model because they have different data that uh, they are training towards. And then as a result, you see them in different colors. And periodically what we do is we create a snapshot of these models, which you see on the left side, and then distribute these models to other tasks that are executing in parallel. Here we see their models and then the model gets interchanged to other task lots. And once all the models have been received, they actually aggregate it and create an aggregated learning or an aggregated model which knows that all the learning from individual parallel tasks have been combined together. And this will be distributed back asynchronously. And then depending on a decay factor, which is basically how much weightage you want to give for the history, you add the decay factor and combine the, the aggregated model with the currently running model. And here it's interesting to note that even though you have aggregated these models and combined it, in the background you'll still be processing your own local data. As a result, these models will still be different. And this process will keep continuing and you can start learning and also provide prediction on top of it. So this is the key idea or simplistic way of doing online learning on streaming data. In order to validate online algorithms, and uh, we use a real-world telco data set where we want to measure the service level uh, agreement violations. Um, where we have a video on demand server that generates the data, and we have multiple clients requesting videos of different sizes and uh, different quality for different durations too. And, and server actually uh, creates the statistics and we'll actually label this uh, to detect violations in terms of SLAs. Uh, the data set is publicly available and the link here uh, dis describes the data set in detail and also provides a link to download it. In terms of the server statistics, uh, we take CPU, memory, networking, and other statistics, and we use the statistics along with it to predict violations when it happens. We want to measure these statistics, or sorry, analyze the statistics to identify or predict our SLA violations. And the loads or, or the, the video request for these to the server could be both uh, periodic or nice, or flash crowd or bursty. And we take this data set and send it through streams to both uh, streaming and as well as the micro batch services for our measurements. Before we start the comparison, we wanted to understand how online algorithms perf perform in comparison with offline algorithms. For which we tried different load scenarios in this from this data set, and we tried two different offline algorithms and compared with our online SVM, uh, online algorithm or accuracy of the online algorithm. From the table, you can clearly see for even for all of the different types of workloads, we get the same or better accuracy than offline algorithms. So even when the workload does not change, online, since it learns faster, can adapt to it quickly and can provide better accuracy. Second, we wanted to compare uh, how does online and offline algorithms work when the data workload changes. In this example, we have the time on the x-axis, uh, and we have accumulated error rate on the y-axis, and the offline SVM algorithm on the red line, the red, that's the red line, and the blue line indicates the online SVM alg algorithm. And here you can see that the training was done uh, on different workload, and the workload changes at some point, and we start predicting, the accuracy drops down. Because it, in machine learning, it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a black box. It needs constant way of learning it or retraining in order to understand what the behavior is going to be or how the behavior is changing. It needs to see that pattern at some form or the other, so you need retraining. And if you don't do retraining, the predictions become worse over time. 
But the, the, and from the graph, you can clearly see that online, since it keeps retraining with incoming data, even if the workload changes, it is automatically able to adapt to it, and as the results provide lower uh, accumulated error rate, which is a nice benefit. So as a summary, basically, online algorithms can quickly adapt as the result can deal with unpredictable workloads or unpredictable behavior in the real world. Um, next, we want to understand the performance of uh, online, sorry, streaming versus a microbatch solution. So here, we actually vary the number of nodes along the x-axis, and we have the y-axis that measures throughputs. That's nothing but thousands of operations per second. And the red indicates a, mic a solution that implements a microbatch, and the blue bar indicates streaming, which is Flink. And we, here, we can clearly see that even with increasing number of nodes, a streaming solution nicely scales, and as a result can deal with uh, this extra hardware or also the increased amount of workload that's been thrown onto it. Uh, next, in the real world, we also care about latency. So let's, in order to understand the latency implications, we try to run uh, the microbatch and streaming with different type of microbatch sizes. The same experiment that we had before was repeated again. On the x-axis, we see time. And the y-axis, we see latency. This latency is in log scale. Okay? And we want it, the lower the latency, the better it is, because we want to be predicting as quickly as possible. So in order to do a low, low latency prediction, one would try to use a low microbatch interval, because you want to create, you want to process the data as quickly as possible. So one would try to keep as small as possible. But the results are interesting, and it's counterintuitive. Even though you try to create, if you look at it, the red line and the green line on the top indicate very low microbatch uh, windows, which means as soon as like a 10 millisecond or 100 millisecond uh, window time, we try to create a microbatch and immediately try to process it. But the problem is that the computation time, if the data is too much, that comes in a small amount window of time. The amount of time waited is, is much uh, lower as compared to the compute time needed to process this data. And as a result, the latency slowly starts increasing. And the steady state comes around hundreds of seconds or so. Even though we want a very low latency processing, we actually get a much higher latency for that. In contrast, if you have true streaming, uh, you can see that the blue line on the bottom indicates you can have a very nice and predictable latencies for processing this data. So which is a very nice and disabled, disabled property, when, especially when you want to implement only algorithms at the edges. So to conclude, in the world of Internet of Things, there are going to be two important trends that are going to drive most of the adoption. We believe it's edge computing and online learning. Edge computing because it can it can reduce the round trip time to go from the things or the sensors all the way to the data center, and then online because you want to learn quickly and adapt to it, and avoid retraining at the center of the cloud as much as possible. What we have done uh, shown in this talk is that we have taken a real world data set and shown that it is possible to provide both low latency predictions or training. In addition to it, we also show that it is possible to scale across multiple nodes um, to do online learning on streaming data using Flink. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions now. Um, I have a question. So for, I think, some of the learning kind of algorithm, they need to kind of iterate through the data over and over again. So in your online kind of training, how do you kind of achieve those kind of effects? If your data already passed, so how do you kind of iterate back? So we don't iterate it back at all. We, we only iterate it once. Okay. And we try to learn, adapt to it as much as possible. And then since the other thing also is that since the data constantly can keep changing, it, there's no point trying to go over the old data as much as possible. You want to learn from the new data but still giving some weightage to the old data. So we don't go through it multiple times. We just do it once and then learn, adaptively keep learning from it. And since we go through a large amount of data constantly, that would equate to going over it multiple times, but not ideally. Okay. 
Uh, I have a kind of separate question. I think one of the kind of charts comparison you showed the, between the mini batch and the streaming, the, the throughput number, the streaming kind of beats the mini batch right, b between Spark and Flink. So Good. I think I understand why Flink will be fast in terms of when you're measuring the latencies. I, I kind of don't really see why your super number is kind of the, the streaming will also be much better than the mini batch. So the, the one of the things that we found out is the synchronization that happens between the nodes uh, in the micro batch approach and that was very high and that was making the bottleneck and not letting it scale nicely. So that was the issue. With every batch it has to synchronize, mini batch it has to synchronize and as a result it did not scale nicely. Correct. What, what measure of error are you using? What do you mean by what? How do you measure your error rate? So we, it's a labeled data, so we actually know what the answer is. We, from our prediction, we, we find out what, is it going to be a violation, still a violation or not, we measure the label. We predict it, we compare it with what has been labeled, and as a result, we know what the error rate is. Spark streaming, yes, that is correct. Uh, actually, to follow up that question is, um, so when you're actually trying to um, make the prediction and then see the actual label and then compare it again, how do you actually make sure that label, because whenever you see this event uh, and you make the prediction, that event's already gone when you actually make the label, how do you coordinate those two? So basically, uh, if it is like um, unsupervised learning, basically that data, whenever it arrives, you can basically do all of the training yourself. But if these two things are separate? It's a great question. So one of the things that you see about online learning is it's incremental. Even if it's done later than the event actually happening, we can feed those uh, label data back into it, and then as a result can keep learning from it also. It can adjust and adapt to it. So it doesn't. It, even if it doesn't happen in real time, you can also put it later on once you can actually label or understand what the outcome is, and you can also get it to feed it again, and then you can learn it learn on the label data. So uh, let me understand correctly. So basically, when you're actually doing the label, you also include a piece of whatever feature that originally go through the system to do the prediction. No, in, this, in, the, in the way that we do it, it, all the data is labeled when it comes through it. So we don't have to send it again. In the real world, if it's not labeled, but the labeling happens later on, you could also take the label data and send it to online learning because it's incremental. It doesn't have to go through all of it. So whatever events that has that an operator or a user identifies as a violation, that can be fed in to learn and adapt to it. Actually, I got a follow-up question on that. So uh, when you actually discuss for the Frank parallelism, you mentioned there are several layers of um, model trainings that actually gets shuffled like the model results are around. So uh, I was kind of trying to understand which part of the model do you actually use to do the prediction? Because you have like multiple layers of that. So models. we actually use the current model that we constantly retrain, constantly are training, which we use for prediction because this is the latest and more accurate result. This aggregated uh, models that we have, okay, for some reason, okay. These aggregated models that we have are actually some point in time might not reflect the latest data, so we only use the, the data that is currently being trained in the local uh, task lots. Or to different nodes. How do you know which node that you want to use to do the prediction? No, or each node will do its own prediction on the data that is coming through. Oh, right. And periodically, all these nodes will interchange their models to share the knowledge so that you don't actually uh, uh, you learn from everybody else and don't have to f <laughs> don't have the issue of being undertrained or overtrained basically you like just to it you actually have a different like a frame called uh, for example every day yeah do you have actually have a frequency that every day you do a baseline training by offline and then you move the model online something like that we do actually it, it makes a huge difference too okay so online has its benefits, but also has its pitfalls too, because 
it does it cannot it doesn't have the global knowledge and like to his previous point it doesn't go through the data multiple times to create different uh, more stronger models it's a trade off basically and if you can combine online and offline we found out that we can get much better accuracy doing it so even not not just each local uh, online models being trained periodically can send the offline models to be sent out which can also be added to this online algorithms too absolutely So, uh, so in the cases where you have flash crowds, right? So there are chances that you run into a bias. So your normalization has to be dynamic in that case, right? So, Correct. So how do you handle that? So dynamic hand, dynamic normalization. So the weights that you give to the offline uh, processing or the online processing. So you'll you'll have to vary that based on the data as well. So so DK exactly. So you're talking about the DK yeah. that we use. So right now, the DK that we have is not very sophisticated. So we try to actually allow the users to provide what the DK factor is going to be. We have used a time-based DK. Even if a flash crowd comes in, since it actually comes in a short amount of time, it doesn't have a huge weightage. <coughs> and as a result, it doesn't affect or sway the model towards. Uh, you said that you tried this with Spark streaming. Uh, have you tried it with the newer Spark structure streaming, or are you planning to try this? No, we haven't tried that yet. Are you planning to do this? Uh, at some point, yes, some absolutely. Point. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thanks again.